Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Laurel Page and I am the Assistant Director of Events at the University of Colorado Boulder's Lead School of Business. Welcome back to our sixth COVID-19 webinar series. This continues to be trying times and here at CU Boulder we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights for life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is the second of six webinars in this COVID-19 related webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're excited to welcome alumnus and the industry and certificate director for MIT system design and management, Bill Ben Linville Engler have here presenting mobilizing a statewide manufacturing response to COVID-19. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Ben, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will presentation. As a reminder, for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Ben Linville Engler is an alumnus of the Mechanical Engineering Program at CU Boulder and the Industry and Certificate Director for MIT System Design and Management, or SDM, where he first joined as a fellow in 2016. SDM is jointly offered by the MIT School of Engineering and Sloan School of Management, focusing on solving complex socio-technical challenges by taking a systems thinking approach to multidisciplinary problem solving, model-driven engineering, design, and strategic decisions throughout the entire product system lifecycle. In his role, Ben establishes strategic industry partnerships identifies industry trends and teaches medical device and project-based courses to help partner companies and students develop new technologies, products, and leaders. Prior to MIT, Ben worked for over a decade in medical device product team and origin development. This experience included serving in vice president roles in technology and product development as well as engineering at Applied Medical, a global vertically integrated company that develops innovative products that improve patient outcomes. Welcome Ben and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand over the webinar controls to you now. Hi, thank you Laurel and Amanda for having me uh, and I appreciate everyone who's joining us. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work that I've been doing as part of a team to mobilize a statewide manufacturing response uh, to COVID-19, uh, as well as some additional work that's come from that. But first, I'd like to introduce a little bit more about who I am and where I come from. Uh, so in 2018, there was an article in the Washington Post that evaluated the most remote towns uh, in the U.S. based off of recent map data from a large metro area. Uh, I found out that I actually grew up in number eight, Holcomb, Kansas. Uh, and actually, it was uh, on a farm about half an hour outside of number eight. Uh, that's actually a picture of me on, my, uh, on the Engler family farm. I think that's my senior year when I was at Boulder. Uh, that might be a, a buff's hat there uh, in, that I have on. Um, but my family did ultimately, uh, we were a dry land wheat farm uh, outside of uh, any irrigation. Uh, so some challenges arose from that. But ultimately, we moved to Colorado and I went to the University of Colorado and um, as Laurel mentioned, I uh, did my undergrad work in mechanical engineering. Uh, I did an emphasis in uh, biomedical engineering as well as a minor in biochemistry. Uh, and after CU, I uh, moved to Southern California to work for a company called Applied Medical uh, that Laurel mentioned. 
uh, is very vertically integrated. And one of the things that really uh, attracted me to that company, um, which is in the image in the bottom right, is each one of those flags that are highlighted is a different uh, building that Applied owns in Southern California. And about 80% of those have some sort of manufacturing process or activity in them. And so for me, it was a really great opportunity to learn um, really the full product life cycle from early um, ideation, design and development through manufacturing. Uh, and they do everything, including product sterilization, clean room manufacturing as well. Uh, and then if you continue down to the bottom left, I had a chance to go to Applied Medical's European uh, sales and distribution office to help stand up product development and engineering uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and so I really did get a chance to take um, different products and systems uh, from idea to market uh, in a highly regulated space um, in the medical device industry and ultimately left Applied uh, as a vice president of product development and engineering uh, after about being there for, for 10 years. Um, and I came to MIT SDM uh, and SDM system design and management was established in 1996. And we really do work at the intersection of business engineering and technology. Uh, as Laurel mentioned, we're a joint program between the School of Management and the School of Engineering. Um, but we really have a, a close coupling with industry. We were ultimately founded in collaboration at the request of industry looking for technically grounded leaders uh, in so this, this program was originally founded in 96 and has really focused on mid-career professionals. So folks like myself who came out of industry with about eight to 10 years of work experience uh, to come back uh, into an academic space and continue to learn some concepts around systems thinking, systems engineering. So we really do focus on deploying a systems thinking approach to systems architecture, systems engineering and project management. And this will make a lot of sense as I get into the work that I've been doing here recently to choose for a life cycle of a product. And so really what that means uh, is that we're trying to uh, take technically grounded folks who have typically been educated on being problem solvers. Uh, maybe there's one problem, one solution, one right answer to how do you actually do more exploration through systems thinking and be a problem seeker. So explore the full problem space, uh, often determine that it's not a single problem you're solving, but maybe a combination of multiples could be market dynamics, technologies, uh, manufacturing quality challenges, um, and also overall product, and really understand your whole design space and the decisions that you have control over uh, to really define maybe not just a single solution, but a set of solutions and make some informed decisions about the trade-offs that exist between those different solutions. Uh, so just quickly, for in this context, for systems thinking, I want you guys to think about this as human connected design, right? Connected to each other, uh, your environment, facilities, workplaces, technologies, right? There's a lot of different boundaries and relationships that exist. Uh, and really, systems thinking is looking at the value that exists between those connections and interfaces and providing a holistic perspective and a way of learning about those. Uh, and in this case, there's a lot of dynamic and emergent properties that come from this uh, through feedback loops, complexity of hierarchies, uh, and, and often unintended consequences, and those can be both good and bad. Um, and a lot of times this has to do with thinking about, you know, delays in decisions. If I make a decision today, you know, the outcome or return on investment may not be for multiple years. And so how do you think about that in the context of what you're doing? And then systems engineering is really about multidisciplinary implementation and problem solving, uh, oftentimes taking into consideration business and technical needs of stakeholders uh, and delivering value through um, typically a, a development process and some discipline around that. Um, and then what we do at MIT SDM is really to address risks and uncertainty throughout the product life cycle, uh, which includes uncertainty of market demands, um, product market fit, uh, all the way through you know, manufacturing service and what comes after. Uh, and we focus a lot on uh, delineating the difference between form, function, and frequency are often looked at as operations of a, of a life cycle to really uh, understand the architectural decisions and intersections um, between those. So I'm gonna jump now into the Massachusetts Manufacturing Emergency Response Team um, and my role within this group. But first, I'm going to kick off with a short video clip um, that one of the companies that's been involved has been putting a short docu-series together that'll give you some context of where we sat 
here in Massachusetts back in uh, early March. There were two nightmares. I mean, one was we wouldn't have enough ventilators. I'm the physician in chief here and my patients would die. That was the first problem. And urgency number two is that we wouldn't have enough of this stuff um, because we were in short supply and we were running through it really quickly. And so I would be sending my people in to situations where they were going to get infected. The number of reported cases, as everybody knows, has seen a significant uptick in the United States and in Massachusetts, and state health officials are closely monitoring and tracing presumptive positive cases. So as this cascading crisis happened, our phone just started ringing off the hook. Put out an email to about 35 people. 50 people showed up on the Zoom call, and we said we need a manufacturing response to this crisis. The notion of the federal stockpile was it's supposed to be our stockpile. The states have been put in a position, especially with PPE, where they have to compete. I think we're quite fortunate here in Massachusetts. You know, we have world-class health systems. We have world-class academic centers and companies with a lot of technical expertise. And we have a lot of manufacturing capability that exists. We were able to activate all of that in parallel. So a little more context, uh, Carolyn, who mentioned that this meeting was convened, uh, it occurred on March 20th. And here in Massachusetts at that time, we had about 85 confirmed cases of COVID. Uh, for anyone who follows uh, Massachusetts news or you know, early outbreaks of the pandemic, uh, there was a biotech company here in Massachusetts that had a large uh, meeting right at the end of February that really accelerated um, the, the outbreak here uh, in, in the Boston area. Um, uh, I would say probably two weeks prior to this, um, ecosystem here in, in med tech and health tech, I started getting a lot of outreach and emails of people wanting to make masks, ventilators, or other products. And uh, from my experience coming from industry, you know, some of these things looked really interesting. And to be honest, a lot of them scared me because uh, there's a huge opportunity, uh, no matter how well intended, to introduce more harm than good. Uh, when it comes to medical devices. There's a, a big difference in this case between the form, you know, what something looks like and, and the function. Uh, and there's a number of hurdles to be able to do this at, at large scale. And so the uh, Massachusetts Technology Collaborative, uh, which Carolyn works for, is an economic development agency uh, under the governor's office, Governor Charlie Baker. Uh, and they have a number of different initiatives, one of which is called the Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative, which they sort of used as the base for this work. Uh, knowing that we had a number of uh, manufacturers in Massachusetts that maybe don't come from medical device but have a relatively good amount of capability and capacity. Um, in addition to this, we have a couple of really world-renowned health systems, the best He for two groups that came on board uh, as well to provide a lot of clinical context for uses of products as well as the demands that they were seeing across their uh, network of hospitals and care centers. Uh, and I mentioned a number of other um, stakeholders in this case, uh, some academic institutions like MIT, um, UMass Lowell, um, but also some groups uh, you may be familiar with the Manufacturing USA Institutes, AFOA, the Advanced Federal or Advanced Functional Fabrics of America organization. And, and a, a great deal of you know, small, medium, and large manufacturers, both from inside the medical device industry and also outside, um, were joining in on these calls. Um, and you know, I, I did what most people have done during the pandemic. We jumped on Slack, um, and I got on a, a, a channel with Professor John Hart from the mechanical department here at MIT and his colleague Hayden Quinlan, and we'd been working together on some other community projects um, for a few weeks and you know, quickly started pulling a plan together. Um, and at this time, I had established a line of communication with the FDA's all hazards respector pathways for uh, respirators, surgical masks, and isolation gowns, and so became on this team, the, the main liaison with the FDA. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what it takes to bring a medical device product to market, I'll quickly go over this. This is what we would call a stakeholder value network. 
Uh, and as I highlighted in systems thinking, it's the relationships and interdependencies between things that are really important. And in this case, if you look in the bottom kind of middle there, the responding entity uh, has a lot of inputs and outputs, uh, things like monetary capital, knowledge capital, physical capital, and compliance constraints. And if you look in the top right corner, specific to PPE, there's this box called buyers. And in this instance, it's state emergency management agencies, it is health centers and other care sites. And they all have different needs in terms of amount of PPE they need, types of use scenarios that they actually are using. So the, the level of protection is varying. So ultimately, how do we provide that information to these manufacturers that might be responding? Um, in the bottom left, we also have suppliers. We're looking at uh, raw material suppliers, could be you know, uh, material for gowns, could be uh, material for um, masks and other things, but then also uh, companies that make parts or have different manufacturing capabilities. Uh, and then kind of in the, the left uh, middle there is the government and also a, a box around payers, but there were a lot of reactions from the CDC for um, how to reduce the use of PPE safely, but then also from the FDA uh, for emergency use authorization or emergency enforcement policies to enable more uh, entities to respond. Um, and so I was able to bring this perspective to our group to say these are a lot of the communication channels that we need to be monitoring for new information on a regular basis so that we can make sure that we're making uh, the right thing for what the frontline needs, but also that we're doing it in a safe and effective way uh, and that our supply chains are um, sound. Uh, we also were against working against the clock like uh, elsewhere in the US that was hit early. Um, we, were, we were targeting a surge peak, I think in mid-April. Um, and so we were really looking at how do we um, prioritize what we're hearing from the front line uh, and look at you know, what level of effort do each of these take, how, what level of impact are they going to have because we can only maybe move so many of these to pivot uh, during the response. Uh, and in this case, there were, you know, a lot of different networks that exist in the greater Boston ecosystem. There's these huge health networks uh, and a lot of, you know, technical engineering and academia networks that were all kind of just colliding uh, independently. Any physician that knew someone who could make something was calling them and saying, I need a mask. Any engineer that knew a physician was calling and saying, what do you need? Uh, a lot of times they didn't understand that there's more than one type of engineer or more, more than one type of physician. And so the translation of information sometimes wasn't always clear. Um, and so there was a really big need to not overburden the front line um, with outreach. And, and then at the same time, uh, also not overburden suppliers. So if everybody's pivoting to make face shields, there's only so many companies that have material that can be used for that. And it's, um, it's really easy and it has happened in multiple instances in the uh, COVID response where suppliers aren't able to keep up or it's too distributed to actually have a large impact. And then just lastly, um, for medical device um, product realization, uh, across the bottom, you know, the general life cycle is there's technology development, demonstration, maybe prototyping, uh, if it's a startup, initial funding and technology transfer, and then really product and manufacturing development, regulatory approval, um, production and launch, and then post-market activities. And in general, you know, the technology um, piece is sort of a foothill to the mountain that is uh, product and manufacturing development and regulatory approval. And oftentimes, uh, again, in the startup space, this gap exists and it's not necessarily recognized the activities around quality system and regulatory controls that is almost a step function once you really want to commercialize a product. Um, in this case, the FDA did take a number of measures to kind of lower the bar a little bit to enable more people to participate. Um, we were really looking at, uh, again, how do we collect and translate all of this information? Uh, I won't go into detail around um, boundary objects and, and differences of syntax, semantics, and, and pragmatic uh, novelty creation, but what's important is that we created cohesion across this set of stakeholders. Uh, we were holding meetings uh, three times a week jumping on a lot of other independent calls in the meantime, but you know, translating things from the clinician's perspective, weighing those against the required testing that we would get from the regulators, um, thinking about how that would impact uh, our manufacturers and the, the materials they were buying, 
uh, and then how could we translate that back to our emergency management agency that might actually need to change their buying behavior or how they're, um, what they're requiring manufacturers to make. And so this is kind of a, a high level view of what we've done, um, that this response process. Uh, again, the needs and demand uncertainty uh, have been fluctuating throughout. There's been a lot of external factors such as the regulatory constraints or the coupling of the economic impact that it's had on different companies. And so even if a manufacturer had the capacity to respond, they may not be able to due to workforce constraints or um, not being able to sustain their business. And then the capacity and capability question uh, was something that you know, we wanted to have visibility on. And so we early on um, did an indexing of the manufacturing capabilities across Massachusetts and it's expanded regionally now. Originally we, see, we received about 400 responses from manufacturers. I think it's up to about 1000 now. And not all those manufacturers could respond, um, but there were times where we were calling on them for specialty um, advice or pairing them together to, to create a supply chain. Uh, ultimately, we have helped about 50 companies pivot their operations. Um, some of these names you may recognize from other industries, New Balance that does um, a footwear and clothing. Love Pop is a greeting cards company who's pivoted to make uh, isolation gowns and we're at a peak manufacturing capacity of about 250,000 a week. Um, and with that, part of what we determined was that we really needed some funding from the state and other groups to help um, these companies with workforce development, material um, supply chain securing uh, or CapEx expenditures. The, the last piece to this is really looking at this as a, as a product life cycle and supply chain. And I'll just quickly go through this, you know, on the top left, starting with needs and demand was really a focus of a sub team of the MERT. Um, we were also looking at inbound new designs coming from either community or other academic projects on the bottom left. Uh, the next dot is verification and validation. And that was really a moving target based off of the uh, almost daily uh, document changes coming from the FDA, depending on the product type. Uh, and then the manufacturing piece there in the middle, we started with how do we do this at scale? And so we were constantly um, finding new manufacturers that maybe had already started initiatives uh, or that we were reaching out to because they had a capability we needed. Um, and then along the lines of the FDA is the quality aspect and how do you do this in a scaled way under good manufacturing um, practices. Uh, use studies with ventilators or um, with respirators, but we were also looking at this for ventilators for um, thinking about service and refurbishment. So you can see some of these products, you know, we worked on face shields, isolation gowns, nasopharyngeal test swabs, surgical masks, hand sanitizers, uh, respirators and ventilators and all, quite a few other things. Um, and we established, you know, this process where we could help evaluate designs, um, connect manufacturers, and then provide a level and also then working with our emergency management agency in Massachusetts there on the bottom right to think about if they're buying products and importing from other countries or getting donations where they're not sure how well these products are going to work, uh, we were able to test those and, and create a level of confidence uh, in them so they could distrib distribute those out. So by mid-May, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has distributed about 10 million pieces of PPE. Again, this is say eight, seven, eight weeks into um, our response. Uh, Two million pieces of PPE uh, and over 1.5 million test swabs. Uh, to date, uh, the impact by volume, we're approaching over 15 million items of PPE, including face shields, face masks, surgical masks, and respirators. Uh, disposable and reusable isolation gowns, uh, hand sanitizers and disinfectants and ventilator components, as well as tens of millions of 3D printed uh, swabs. You can see there in the top right, uh, that's Governor Andrew Cuomo. If any of you have seen the YouTube video of him getting swabbed, that is a uh, test swab that we worked on uh, with the, um, a number of industrial 3D printing companies that kind of formed a consortium uh, in March and April. Uh, and one of them is, is pushing to print, you know, roughly 1 million swabs per day. 
Uh, in addition to this, I mentioned the testing that we've established. And so we've been able to help uh, MEMA validate performance of international products uh, before they reach end users, uh, testing over 700 models or batches, which is a millions of items of PPE. Uh, and through this, I mentioned the economic issues that companies have faced. We've been able to help companies add or sustain um, sort of I will just point out, um, I mentioned I'm, I, I came to Colorado. I'm originally from Kansas. I am not a Patriots fan. You guys may be happy to know. Unfortunately, I'm also not a Broncos fan. I am a Chiefs fan. So I'm uh, pretty excited about that game. So during all of this, you know, and I started with some map uh, images of where I grew up in Kansas. And to me, really understanding kind of the situational awareness is really important. Um, so that we could make informed decisions about how to use our resources. And so what I've done here is created a network model of all of the projects that we were seeing across our ecosystem. Uh, a lot of bottom-up innovation occurs in the greater Boston area during normal times, and that continued into the pandemic response. And one of the challenges was really filtering out some of that noise so that we could make uh, as big of an impact and as quickly as possible. Uh, if you're interested in playing around with the model, there's a link here hosted on the SDM website. Uh, you can uh, kind of navigate through it in different ways to understand uh, different aspects of the response beyond just PPE um, as well. And so where this is going um, beyond the response that we've had and I think the impact that it's had here locally is we are looking at um, capturing this and thinking about what could we do more proactively in the future. And we recently received an NSF uh, grant award to actually, one, document this, but also uh, think about how to um, better establish, uh, you know, ecosystem engineering efforts uh, to tackle um, forward-looking problems. So I'm going to quickly then jump into some follow-on work outside of Public Health, as well as the Harvard uh, Software Center for Ethics. Uh, there's a link here where you could get to this sort of view on uh, relative risk that I'll talk about in a second. But uh, as we were coming past our uh, peak surge of now it is our first surge, we're in the middle of a second one at the moment. Um, I connected with uh, Danielle Allen, who's the director of the Software Center for Ethics at Harvard. And during the, the initial response, they had been working on a roadmap to pandemic resilience, really looking at how do you scale testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation. Uh, and we had been working on you know, the supply chain aspects of uh, test swabs and viral transport media. And so we connected and I said, you know, I think we can help look at how do we implement and operationalize this in Massachusetts. Uh, and we connected and are now leading a group called Massachusetts Testing, Tracing, and Supported Isolation Collaborative, uh, MATSI for short. Uh, and one thing I will say is when you find a good diagram during a crisis, just stick with it and keep reusing it. Um, but we took a functional uh, decomposition view to uh, the testing process. And so starting from the last left, kitting and sourcing, thinking about sample collection, sample transporting to maybe a centralized lab, uh, sample processing through PCR or other methods. How do you communicate results to the original patient? How do you do contact tracing? Um, ultimately, when you find that you need to disinfect an environment, how do you get that information to uh, the city? And then how do you support isolation? So folks that need to either quarantine or isolate, um, how do they do that safely? How do they have resources? And there were a lot of different individual aspects of this going on in Massachusetts. And so our first goal was, let's identify what's going on. Um, let's think about some metrics around this systems process that are really critical to not just containing the virus, but suppressing it. And you can see there in the center, um, we were really focused on a 24 hour turnaround time for test results from the time you get swabbed to the time in which that information gets to contact tracers. Uh, and this feedback loop here of getting people who have been in close contact with someone who's positive also tested was really important. Uh, a simplified view of this and some of the groups that we found that were, were, were working on this in the state, um, we connected with and have formed this collaborative. 
Uh, and we really had two focus. One has been here in Massachusetts, what can we do to continue to improve this, make things more accessible or equitable uh, to groups that need access to testing or other support. But then there was a whole national campaign um, through the Harvard Global Health Institute on how do we debrief this to, or brief this out to groups like the National Governors Association, the US Conference of Mayors, other state response efforts, how do we share best practices? And then ultimately, um, when we look on the bottom right, thinking about higher education, surveillance or, or a screening testing look like, and is there funding from the federal government for that? And from my original work, you know, what is the link to long-term demand for PPE? Because when you start to model this out over 18 months, you need millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of gloves, gowns, face masks, and surgical masks. And you know, we don't have the capacity here to do that ourselves. Uh, from that, we also you know, quickly just looked at, you know, there might be statewide testing processes, but how do you address hotspots? Um, I understand Colorado's been uh, hit with a few really terrible fires recently. And oddly, the language that we started following was a lot to do with how do you put out um, large fires. Uh, and so I think that that sort of um, analogy or metaphor, uh, actually thinking about how do you deploy resources holds through for a lot of this. Uh, and just other aspects of this is, you know, how do you help people understand all of the efforts and data management and communication that exists around uh, things like contact tracing, right? It's not a single person, um, but you're transferring test results to a patient, the state health board needs to get the information, the contact tracing folks need to figure out how to identify contacts and track those quickly. Uh, and then thinking about workforce development, how do you actually uh, find people that one, have a, a level of empathy for connecting with someone who maybe has tested positive, but also is tech savvy enough to use Salesforce. Um, so a lot of, like I said, small problems connected to this larger response issue. Um, I'll skip over this one, but different sort of operational factory view model of multiple different test sites operating as a single regional lab, right? The, the time turnaround time isn't the same at every lab. And so when you look at te testing data, what time domain are you looking at was a question we've been pursuing. Uh, and then ultimately at that national level um, with the uh, limited response that we've seen from the national government, uh, how do we maybe look to states to collaborate together to form interstate compacts or memorandums of understanding uh, to do group purchase for different types of testing. And we saw one come together from our work uh, between Maryland, Louisiana, Massachusetts, and I think up to six other states now um, to, to purchase large amounts of uh, rapid antigen tests. Uh, I, I, I showed this map early when I transitioned to this part of the discussion, but one of the things that we identified uh, in this group and that the Harvard Global Health Institute had been working on is really visualizing relative risk. Uh, early in the pandemic, you know, we didn't have visibility as to where infections were occurring because we had limited testing data. And so we couldn't make informed decisions. Uh, and unfortunately at that time, uh, you know, everybody to make necessarily the same everywhere. And so what this map does is it, it identifies the uh, number of new infections per 100,000 people over a seven day moving average. You can look at it uh, worldwide, you can look at it by state or by county. Uh, and you, you can make adjustments to this to refine it more, but it gives you a sense of kind of what actions may I, should I, should I take in my location? Uh, and that was something we didn't have really targets, right, to work towards at the local level. Uh, and if you don't have a, a target to control against, you don't know how well or how poorly you're doing. Um, and this has been something that's continued uh, to develop that we've been tracking and looking at how do you use these targets we've established as to green, yellow, orange, red risk levels that identify with the number of positive per 100,000 to make decisions around reopening schools or businesses, et cetera. Um, so this video is going to show you this over uh, the March to October time period. The cursor is on Finney County, Kansas. So this is where I grew up in Holcomb, the eighth most remote town in the U.S. from a large metro area.
this is a, a human connected problem, right? No matter how remote a town is, they have found that they've been infected um, by this virus. Uh, and I think to me that just again goes to the interdependencies that exist between us as people, our, our economy and, and our way of life. So that video stops on October 4th. Uh, unfortunately, things have continued. ago. Um, we have over 20 states that have uh, 25 or more cases per 100,000 in the U.S. Um, what you'll see here in, is, uh, you know, a zoom in on Massachusetts uh, and the county I currently live in is Middlesex County. I think we're at about 12 cases per 100,000 and then Finney County, uh, Kansas, where I grew up uh, and it's substantially uh, higher at this point. Again, population distances, densities are different. You can adjust for that. Um, but about 103 cases per 100,000 people. Uh, and to per put that into more perspective, outside the U.S., uh, you know, the, the highest country right now for infections is Andorra, that's um, about 122, but we're seeing surges across Europe right now. France and Germany has just uh, announced lockdowns again, um, you know, based off of kind of their responses. And so for me, again, how do you create the situ situational awareness to inform your personal decisions has been really important to this. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're in the, a second surge here in Mass Massachusetts uh, regardless. So just in closing, before we jump to questions, you know, COVID is a human connected problem, right? Transmission doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, and there's a lot of work left to do. There's no silver bullet to this, right? We need to think about preventative measures like masks, physical distancing, et cetera. But we also need testing and we also need treatments and we also need to support people so they can isolate and we ultimately will need a vaccine. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of power in collaboration and coordination. And I think to me, one of the things that I've been most hopeful in this is the work that I've been doing in the MERT or through MATSI has been, you know, I hope that coming out of this, we can catch our stride as a country uh, and really collaborate and coordinate more uh, together because we can achieve a tremendous amount. So just wanna quickly say thank you to a really long list of collaborators and volunteers and you know, those that are leading the response across Massachusetts and the US. The US um, is, like I said, a lot of work left to do. Uh, and unfortunately heading into the winter cycle, the next you know, six to 12 months might be uh, more challenging. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to open it up for questions. Thank you, Ben. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions for Ben, please put them in the Q&A interface at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question we are um, going to start with is from Steve. How do you handle supplier and part qualification in medical device tier two and three components during emergency response times? Yeah, so I, I won't go into a lot of detail as to, you know, the importance of supplier controls and, and risk management for medical devices. But um, as we were seeing, you know, new material suppliers maybe coming out of the automotive industry to work with uh, companies that could convert that material into gowns, uh, it was important to understand, you know, the origin of the material, its specifications, um, but ultimately we would test it right? Because it needs to have a certain level of liquid barrier protection. But then also kind of that next level is for the company that's converting it. If they're adding seams, those seams also need to be tested so that you can um, uh, ensure that, the, that there won't be any liquid that gets through. And so the, the big thing is to test, right? Trust, but verify. Um, and in this case, that's where the FDA was sort of establishing, you know, risk to benefit uh, decisions uh, and set, setting, you know, you can waive this regulation right now, but you really need to test this specification and this standard. And a lot of the standard bodies made those standards available for free during this. Um, so it's, it's a combination of, you know, tests and inspect um, and understand where things come from. Thank you, Ben. Uh, the next question comes from Eric. 
What specific government programs exist for local slash national PPE manufacturing? So funding um, for companies through the MERT. And so we had an application process to look at things like um, uh, equipment purchases, if they needed to expand a line, uh, maybe to be able to procure material for six months or longer. There were a lot of times where uh, these manufacturers would, would have availability for material and then two days later it disappeared. Um, and so we established that. There's also now a number of opportunities through the NSF for uh, response grants or through some of the Manufacturing USA institutes that exist you know, across the US uh, as well. Um, and I think there's a large number of philanthropic bodies that are um, putting money into uh, testing as well as uh, PPE response and other things. Thank you, Ben. Our next question comes from Roger. Um, what is the site slash software you were using that shows case con concentration by county and country, um, the software that was on the previous couple slides? Yeah, so that was done in collaboration with Microsoft. I think it's PowerBook that they've used. Right, is if you search for Harvard Global Health or Brown Public School of Health, you know, COVID map, I think you'll find it. Uh, and it lets you click in again by county and state. That was sort of, sort of a short video clip, but I can make sure that the team here has the link uh, to that uh, after this that can go out with the, the recording. Thank you, Ben. Um, Next question is from Virginia. So, and also in related to the map you just showed, are the cases per 100,000 as per day or total numbers in a city on a given day? So it's, it's cases per 1,000. And so the, the average has gotten more accurate over time because the test turnaround time for COVID results has become more consistent. Um, one of the charts that I kind of skipped over a little bit is that, you know, there's been a time period where our large labs like Quest or LabCorp have had, you know, delays in getting test results for two weeks. So you can have a swab and then two weeks later you get your results. But if you go into a hospital and they're testing everybody that comes in, you get your results in a day. If both of those are reported at the same time, the question is really what time period are you looking at for when that case gets reported? So the seven day moving average kind of helps with that. Um, but it's not, you know, going to be accurate, I think, to the minute. It's, it's getting better. Um, but I think one of the, the sort of challenges coming in the future is a lot of these tests have, you know, been centralized labs to a certain degree, PCR type tests. Um, you know, here in Massachusetts, the Broad Institute is doing a whole lot around that. But as you get into more point of care at home type tests for antigen or CRISPR based tests, it becomes harder to not just you know, the logistics of the physical goods, but the data management is a really big challenge. Uh, and there's been, a, you know, instances where, you know, at a state, a state border, you have one state that's offering free testing, you have one state that's not. And so you have people that cross over from one state to the other. And so there's sort of these jurisdictional or system boundaries that we've, that are established that make that even more challenging. Thank you, Ben. Um, the next question is from Thomas. With all the dependencies, manufacturers, government agencies, hospital groups, et cetera, how um, did you quickly get the necessary buy-in and even make contact with the right people to drive these near immediate changes to their organization? That's a, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, part of it was I mentioned that the mass tech group had a pre-established advanced manufacturing collaborative. And so there was already trust around that network, right? They, know, they knew who MassTech was and their connection to the state. The state had, has been investing in advanced manufacturing for three to five years. Um, I think there's also a lot of recognition of you know, who Mass General is, who Beth Israel is in this ecosystem or MIT and others. Um, but ultimately, like we didn't spend two weeks coming up with a mission statement in the group. It was two minutes. You know, when Dr. Zidel, who was, he's the chief of medicine at Beth Israel says, I'm really worried, right? And you could see the level of concern that he had. There's not a lot of negotiating as to whether this is something that we should do. People just start jumping into it. I think the challenge then is, you know, funneling all of that energy and effort into a cohesive process so that we could actually make progress. And I think that's where a lot of, you know, what I brought from my 
experience in the medical device space on the, the steps to um, ultimately commercializing a product, but then also how do we stage and understand streams. The core group of, you know, is 50 on the calls, but probably, you know, 12 to 15 very active, right, are, are exchanging information and coming to resolutions multiple times a week. And we used, you know, a mix of email, Zoom, Slack, text, you know, there's a lot of different layers of communication. Thank you, Ben. Um, our next question comes from Heidi. Thinking back to your college days, what advice could you give to a freshman engineering student today? Yeah, I um, so I, I came to Boulder under the engineering open option. Uh, I didn't know what area of engineering I wanted to major in. And I think for me, you know, the, it gave me unintentionally an opportunity to explore. Uh, so I remember uh, I had like a survey course my freshman year where every, you know, a, a, lead faculty in that department came in to talk about their research and I think they brought in an alumni to talk about their work and for me I think having you know an opportunity to explore is really important um, and that's tough in engineering because there's also a lot of courses that are required in sort of your baseline math and other other courses um, but I, I would say also I I probably explored more on the, the course side, but there's a lot more to get involved in that ultimately informs your learning and college experience. And so uh, don't be hesitant to get involved in other, you know, extracurricular, co-curricular activities. Um, and, I, and I'd also say, you know, I've probably done this more going back to get a, a master's degree after 10 years is really reach out to alumni. People love talking about what they do. And I, I still do that now with my job. And, trying to make new industry, reach out to them and then ask them out, who else should they, who should, you, should you talk to? Um, so just, I, I would say, don't, uh, don't be shy is, is sort of a big one, which I know can be challenging sometimes uh, coming into a new, a new area uh, and even right now during COVID times. Thank you, Ben, um, appreciate that advice. Um, we're gonna move into our final question. So this one comes from Paige. How do we incentivize businesses to participate in restructuring or repurposing their manufacturing operations? That's a, that's a very complicated question for a couple reasons. And in particular for medical devices, there's a lot of challenges around the buyer behavior um, that don't necessarily incentivize uh, investment in new, new manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, during the COVID response, right, the global supply chains dried up, and so the people were somewhat forced into this. Um, but I can't say that in all instances, the products that we made were cost competitive with what you could get from China or elsewhere around the globe. So one of the big things that is being evaluated right now, and there's some, we've seen some health systems, what they were doing before. But from like a risk mitigation standpoint and to not be in this situation again they're going to take a certain portion of their procurement budget and they're going to set that aside for local and they know they may pay a little bit more but it's going to put them in a better position um, i think the other aspect to this is also looking at um, you know there's there's manufacturing capabilities that are independent of industry and and i think Part of that is then thinking about what industries are really critical here in the U.S. and there's a lot of questions going on around this, but um, there's a lot of opportunities around, you know, advanced manufacturing capabilities, the digital side to this and new cybersecurity roles um, that groups like these manufacturing USA institutes. Uh, there's another national group called the Advanced Manufacturing um, Community Collaborative that are really focused on this and some work with governmental organizations. We could, we could create as much manufacturing capacity as we wanted, but if no one's gonna buy what you're making, uh, it doesn't make it long-term uh, something that is viable. And so we have to think of the market dynamics as well. Thank you, Ben. Um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And thank you again to Ben for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni?
We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a survey. To view upcoming webinars, we will, as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at www.colorado.edu backslash alumni or business backslash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is tomorrow as assistant professor in the Department of Advertising Public Relations and Information at the University of Colorado Boulder, Toby Hawk presents fake news. What is it and what does it matter? In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs. <laughs>